As we've been picking along in the book of Acts on Sunday nights, we've come to a point where it would be appropriate for me to address the particular theme for this evening, how to know the will of God. We're actually at Acts chapter 15, verse 36, but we're going to sort of roam freely in the book of Acts this evening as we look at the theme of guidance. So if you'll just keep your Bible open to somewhere around the book of Acts, we'll have continued reference to a number of different verses. The specific will of God, how to know the will of God. Sometimes we know what God's will specifically is, and we struggle to do it. That was the case where Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane prayed, Thy will be done. He knew what the Father's will was concerning himself, that he was to go to the cross, and yet he struggled with it. There are other occasions when we don't know specifically what God's will might involve, but we still pray in his will. Thus Paul, in writing to the Romans from the city of Corinth, as he prepares to leave for a journey to Jerusalem, says to the Roman Christians that he trusts in the will of God that he might come to them. He did not know if it was going to be God's ultimate plan directionally for him to go to Rome, but he casts his plans in under the qualification in the will of God. I simply note that because there are, there's been some teaching in the body of Christ in recent years that it is inappropriate to condition any prayer request by stating, now according to your will, that somehow we are supposed to have sufficient knowledge, spiritually intuitive grasp of what God's will is, that we simply come to God in faith and say, God, this is the way I want it, and I have faith to claim it, and here's what it is. So that if we would qualify it in his will, somehow we would be defeating faith. Well, one of the effective ways to learn how to make decisions is to read the totality of Scripture respecting any particular theme. That, by the way, is an advantage in your life if you will go through Scripture verse by verse and chapter by chapter. It will protect you from a lot of error. Because most heresy or doctrine that get off kilter are based upon a selective reading of texts. But a person who goes through Scripture on a continual basis in their life begins to get a familiarity with the totality of God's Word so that you can use it as a balance. And when, says, when someone says something, you then immediately say, oh, but that doesn't check out with Romans 1, 9 or whatever, and, and, you, and you, haven't, you haven't fit that into your analysis, and you, you, therefore you have, a, you have a, a jaded view, you have an off-kilter view. Jesus, in fact, in teaching us how to pray, tells us one of the fundamental prayers that we are to give in life is uh, thy will be done, thy will be done. And that assumes that God does have a will for us. Now I'd be the first to say and to admit that 95% of God's will for our life is already known to us. Now that may somewhat st strike you as a surprise, but the scriptures have a rather elastic and expansive view of God's will. God is not so much nearly concerned what we're going to do and where we're going to go as with what kind of person are we going to be. He's far more concerned about being than he is about doing or going. So if you come this evening saying, I want God's specific direction in my life, even if you get it and you know exactly what job to take or what major to have in school or what college to attend or what person to marry, you may directionally have established God's will for your life, but if you are not within God's will in your internal character and disposition, then it matters not that you are going to the place or doing the kind of thing God wants you to do. For the major concern of God is, are you becoming the person God wants you to be? And thus, knowing the will of God is no talisman. It's no magic coin flip in the air that somehow we uh, say the magic numbers or recite the magic prayer or get the right person to pray for us or give us a prophetic word and ergo, thereafter, we know God's will. The will of God, for example, if you want to find passages of Scripture to concentrate on deeply about knowing God's will, I would suggest three passages in particular that always speak to us about God's will as it relates to our personality formation, the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, 
the love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13, and the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. There are fundamental qualities of personality development that the Lord seeks in our life. And if you and I are being that kind of person, we probably have a lot of options about where we can go and about what we can do. Because we'll be the right kind of person. And God may choose to play us like a piano with all 64 keys and send us out in any number of different directions because that's where God's concern is. I would not be so fated in the will of God to suggest to any young person here that there is only one person that is in God's perfect will for you to marry. It may be that any number of people could meet the directional test for the will of God, but none of them would meet that test if you are a person that uh, is walking a lot of anger, jealousy, rage, resentment, unforgiveness, those kinds of things. So although I'm not going to beg the question, the specific will of God, I do want to form this very broad rule right at the beginning. Don't try to take a shortcut to the will of God directionally by omitting a concentration on what kind of person God wants you to be. And, I, and I've suggested 95% of what God wants us to, to do in regard to His will is a matter of our being. So in a sense, the will of God is much like uh, an iceberg, uh, which is 90% underwater. Uh, 90, 90 to 95% of the will of God is known to us. Therefore, it's the, it's the small fragment that we don't know that we're going to be concerned with in this message. Well, when you're making a decision, how many in this audience this evening are in the course of making some kind of decision? Could I just see a hand? Oh, a lot of people here. How many of you anticipate within the next five years you're going to make a decision of some kind? <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, well, okay. Uh, that gets most of us. I just wanted to get everybody involved in this message. <clears throat> I normally, as you know, do not get real doctrinaire and uh, say this is the only way to look at something. But I have uh, found that the particular grid of patterns that I use for determining God will, God's will are very accurate and reliable and I think rather complete. And if you, in looking at decision-making questions, will apply these five principles to your life, you will generally come up with a sense of direction. Now that direction will not always dawn upon you in a moment's time. It may take some process of working out because some things are not discoverable except by walking through them step by step. But they are very foundational and fundamental aspects of discovering God's will for our life. And they're all out of the book of Acts, which is really a book about God's guidance. Acts, when you come right down to it, is how the Holy Spirit led the church from 120 people to, within a course of 30 years, a worldwide enterprise. That, regard, that, that needed the guiding power of the Holy Spirit and people needed to respond to the Holy Spirit so they made good decisions that produced the kind of results that we see in the early church. What were the ways that they received guidance? Well, there are five. Uh, the first one is through supernatural revelation. Through supernatural revelation. And this is the one that in seeking God's will in my own life, I always try to look to first. Lord, give me a revelation. There are uh, several ways that God may grant a revelation by angel, by an overpowering, overwhelming personal presence of the Lord Himself, or by some powerful manifestation of His presence, which while not visible, nevertheless is overpowering in its effect. I'll look at uh, those three for a moment. Can we receive God's guidance directionally by means of angel? Yes, with qualification. There is never anyone in the New Testament, nor I believe in the Old Testament, that ever received God's long-term guidance in their life by angelic visitation. But there is short-term guidance generally related to life-saving emergencies or to witnessing efforts, like in the book of Acts. Uh, angels grant to Peter guidance out of jail, don't they? And they grant Philip a guidance to the Ethiopian eunuch so that he might witness to him, Acts chapter 8, as he's on his way down to Gaza and ultimately back to Ethiopia. There was a very short-term guidance. So I would not suggest, based on that pattern, that you look for God's long-term guidance for your life, what kind of career you're going to engage in or what kind of college you're going to choose, necessarily by an angelic manifestation. However, there are those occasions when the Lord supernaturally revealed Himself 
to someone, and those occasions are extraordinarily rare. I would not look for them as a common kind of thing. The only such occasion in the book of Acts, for example, where the Lord himself personally appeared after his ascension into heaven, was to Saul of Tarsus. Acts chapter 9, where he appeared in a fashion of a blinding light and said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Is it not hard for you to kick against the goads? And uh, Saul hears the Lord speaking to him. Now, all of us, I think, would prefer that the Lord guided us that way. If we could just get into a personal place of prayer and, and say, Lord, turn on the light. I w I'd like to hear a voice in the room. I, I have never personally heard the audible voice of God. I would love to hear that voice. And, and if it's in this lifetime, great. I know someday I will. Is there any, in anyone here who, who has heard God audibly speak to you? And you know beyond a doubt it was the audible voice of God. Several of you have. But I notice that the percentage is probably less than 3% of the audience. And that would, that would equate with Scripture. Even, however, when God speaks to a person audibly, makes an audible manifestation of himself, there are two things we should keep in mind about that. Number one, it is of such a sufficient character that you can still doubt it. We would like a kind of an overpowering revelation that would remove all possibility of doubt. If you look, however, at the supernatural revelation by the Lord to Paul, you'll find it interesting complementary section of verses, one in Acts 9 and one in Acts 22. In Acts 9 it says, Paul heard the voice. But in Acts 22, where later Paul recounts the story of the Damascus Road, he says that the soldiers saw the light, but they did not hear the voice. Well, what's happening here? Obviously, what is occurring is that the soldiers only heard sound they did not hear articulated words. It was only to Paul on that road that the words had an articulated presence, and he understood them. No one else traveling in his company heard the articulated words, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Therefore, when Saul got up from that overpowering experience, even though he was blinded, had he turned to someone and said, what did you hear? they would have said to him, we didn't hear anything but sound. Did you hear something? Are you hearing things? And he had sufficient room to doubt his experience. Slim, a slim uh, thread of doubt perhaps possible, but it was there. Because God, in revealing himself to us, always leaves us room to back out. God never in the scripture so overpoweringly reveals himself that you do not have the freedom to say no. That would obviously destroy free will if he overrode your power to say no. So that's one thing we must keep in mind. Even if you get an overwhelming order from God, there's going to be something about it that can, you can still say, well, did I really hear right? The second thing is those who get this kind of revelation from God are given it for a very special reason, and that is they're going to be called to go through things that um, other persons normally are not called to go through. That's the downside of a personal overpowering spiritual revelation. And, I, and now I don't want to get any of you that raised your hand a moment ago in a kind of a box of worry. But I would suggest to you that it is a biblical pattern, whether Old Testament or New Testament, that anybody that received an overpowering, overwhelming, direct call from God had consequent to that call an incredible lifetime of suffering and difficulty and trial. Isaiah, Elijah, Moses, take Paul himself. Which explains then the reason why God gave them this revelation. They needed an anchor to hold on to because they were going to be called to walk through deeper waters than most people are called to walk. And in the midst of walking through those waters, they needed some kind of deeper level of assurance. Now, since I've discovered that in Scripture, I don't pray quite as earnestly for the audible voice of God. <laughs> it's, uh, it's welcome if it occurs, but, uh, you know, I know if it happens what's going to be involved. Of course, the other possibility is that God will make himself known to us 
in a, a less overpowering presence, but still a supernatural manifestation such as he did to Moses, now skipping out of Acts to Exodus, with the case of the burning bush. But again, all those situations still require faith and still require a life of difficulty. But start there. If you're looking for God's will in your life, has God given you some overpowering spiritual revelation of himself? A second thing to look for in determining the will of God. Let's say you're, you've prayed and you've sought God and there is no, there is nothing concretely audible, objective that's out there. Uh, God's not speaking to you in some kind of revelatory way. That leads us then to the second means of guidance. What is going on in your heart while you're at worship? Whether you are worshiping alone or whether you are worshiping with believers, worship is a time when the Holy Spirit is extremely active in our life, providing us direction. Girls, you're going to need to sit up, okay, and listen. Uh, take, for example, the matter of personal guidance through, uh, through worship with the Apostle Peter. Acts chapter 10. What does he do? It's noon, and it's the time for prayer, and he goes up to the rooftop to pray. Can you imagine the history of the Christian church had Peter missed his appointment with prayer that day? Here it's going to be the breakthrough moment, the moment when God is going to link together the old Jewish church with a Gentile convert out there, Cornelius at Caesarea, and that's going to provide the prototype, the pattern for the expansion of the church to the uttermost parts of the world. That's an utter necessary connection if the gospel is going to get from Jerusalem to Rome, which is the whole story of Acts. And it all hangs that day on whether Peter has kept his appointment with God in prayer. Remember that when he was appointed uh, to uh, get away from serving tables, one of the things he said that he needed to do was to give himself to the ministry of the Word and to what? To prayer. So having given himself to prayer, he's keeping those appointments. And while in that place of prayer, what happens? A revelatory experience in the form of a vision, not something overpowering like Paul, but something you could wake up and say, did I eat too much spaghetti for lunch? Uh, what's going on here? Why am, I, why am I having this vision? But he understands in that vision that God has appointed him to follow whoever comes to knock on his door. And God uses that. If he had not kept his personal time of worship, he would have missed that. I, was, I would probably guess that a lot of us stagger in knowing God's will and don't get connections because in a regular way we do not interface with God. And it's really critical, therefore, that we have those personal times on a daily or weekly basis or however when we give specific time personally, to seeking the Lord and to prayer. God also may speak to us uh, through not only a prayer, as he did with Peter, but on a personal level, uh, reading the Word would also be an aspect of worship. Sometimes we may get guidance through reading the Word, although as a general rule, that guidance from the Word will be general in character. It... Um, Usually you cannot pick up the Bible and put your thumb on a verse and that tells you your life direction. I've had miserable experience with that, by the way. I've, I have tried doing that. Let's see if I have any luck tonight. <laughs> Do you give the horse his strength or clothe his neck with a flowing mane? Do you make him leap like a locust, striking terror with his proud snorting? <laughs> I, oh, it always happens to me. Well, so I sit there saying, oh, wow, what in my life is a horse with a neck with a flowing mane and leaps like a locust? You know, oh, well, oh, let's see, try again. Huh. You have established your people Israel as your very own forever, and you, O oh Lord, have become their God. Well, that ministers to me in a general direction. God has established me as this person, but he still hasn't told me what I'm to major at in college. One more time, Lord. What does a poor man gain by knowing how to conduct himself before others? <laughs> Not too bad. <laughs> you know who actually originated that process of God's guidance was a group of people called the Moravian Pietists in Europe about the 17th century that produced the Pietistic uh, movement and the modern missionary movement. 
And there have been, by the way, many people who have had unique experiences with the Bible in knowing God's will. In a directional sense, there's all of a sudden a verse that's left, leaped out of them and it's just confirmed something. Generally, that kind of experience is a confirming word rather than a directional word. You've already sensed the direction, bang, there's a verse that just picks you up and knocks you over the head. Uh, about three years ago when we were trying to raise money to build a parking lot, and how many of you know that's about the toughest money a church can raise? And I was trying to link that together with a scripture. And I thought, there are, there are no scriptures in the Bible that speak of a mandate uh, to give funds for a parking lot. But I found a scripture in Isaiah where Hezekiah was given an order by God to build stalls. <laughs> and uh, it was a real confirming uh, direction. So generally, when we open the Bible, it is confirming general directions, not specific directions. Though sometimes, again, there can be an exception. In worship, sometimes we get a real impression of what God wants us to do when we are gathered together in the community that is worshiping. And within the context of community, whether it is an entire worship service such as this, or whether it is a small group praying and sharing together, God's will becomes crystallized for us. I cited an example, Acts chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. While the prophets and teachers at Antioch, there were five of them named, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Lord said, set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. They went into that time of seeking the Lord without a clear sense of direction, not even anticipating a missionary journey, but as a result of their being gathered together and concentrating on the Lord, the Lord pressed their hearts on the matter of their ministry to the world. How is it when you look at missionaries, for example, that most of them get their call? They get it within the context of a worship experience in a body, a youth camp, a Sunday night service, a worship context of some kind, where the Holy Spirit impresses them with some broad field of the world, lays it on their heart. It becomes a, a deep impression upon them. And one of the things we need to watch, out, uh, watch for in worship is that whenever we are worshiping God truly, and as our hearts get more and more focused upon God, suddenly we come to an electric moment in worship where God focuses our hearts on what is His heart, and that is the world. And our worship suddenly gets translated out to evangelism and mission and purpose and discipleship. And that's what happens in the Antiochian church among the prophets and teachers. While they're worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit says. The reason why I've been in Newport Mesa Christian Center these years is that 17 and a half years ago at the close of October of 1970, the last week of October, we were having a spiritual emphasis meeting at Evangel College. And in a college setting, now we've become, we're too sophisticated, we don't like to use the old word revival, so we use the word spiritual emphasis, which is, is okay, new nomenclature for a new generation. I think probably the generation that grows up in 2010 if the Lord tarries will go back to the word revival and then in 2040 they'll be using spiritual emphasis. So we, it just kind of comes and goes. We were having a sophisticated college, a spiritual emphasis week, you understand. And it was a great revival. It was one of the, one of the greatest revivals I've ever been at in my life. You know it's a revival on a Christian college campus when the chapel is packed in the evening meetings. I mean, that's the, that is the test of a revival as well as, of course, young people hungering and seeking after God, which was happening. I'd been campus pastor less than a year. I'd just finished my doctoral work at uh, Fuller Seminary and planned to stay at Evangel College the rest of my life. That was where I was going to be. And uh, on the second night of that meeting, I uh, looked across the expanse of that chapel, which was filled with 1,000 students, just a sea of faces. Evangel had 1,000 students at the time. And I looked off in the distance and there was a student's painting, Charlie Bittroff's painting of the crucifixion. And it was dimly lit by the glow of soft spotlights. And as I stared across that sea of faces, I was sitting in a front row and it was a long oblong chapel. I just, as I looked at that, suddenly everything else in the room kind of faded into the background and I heard an inner voice, not an audible voice, an inner voice saying, George, look around here because this isn't going to be your place of ministry much longer. And I just, huh? Uh, our children were very young. We just bought a house. I just, I'd done my doctoral work on the wonderful subject of the role of the campus pastor at the evangelical college. 
I had followed the proper advice, by the way, in doing a doctorate, pick a subject that none of your advisors know anything about <laughs> and become the expert on it. And you have a lot less rigorous time in your orals. So I had done that. Nice examination of the survey of the Christian college, its history, purpose, tensions, mission, and all those kinds of things. Then campus ministry role. And I mean, I was set to do that the rest of my life. And then there comes this voice out of the blue, inwardly. Look around here. It was in a time of worship. I just wanted to, uh, it was sort of like a seed landing in your life. And you, once, it's, uh, once it's begun to germinate, you can't pick it out. It's, it's there. And I, I, I couldn't get this out, although I didn't say anything to anyone about it. It was just there. Didn't say anything to Jewel. Uh, later, months later, when we finally came here, I was to discover that that same week, uh, the church, which was then Glad Tidings Assembly of God in Newport Beach, had called the last week of October of 1970 as a week of prayer and fasting for the entire congregation that God would lead them as they began their search. Little did we realize that simultaneously we were having spiritual experiences that God was going to connect together. Worship is indeed uh, an important means of gaining God's will in our life. The scripture I cited from Acts 13, 2 appears to have been guidance by means of a prophetic word. The Holy Spirit said, set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. In other words, they already had the call, they just didn't know the timing. Now, when you say the Holy Spirit said, generally the scriptural rule is that the Holy Spirit does not speak like through the PA system. You won't find in, in, in any church that I have ever heard of that in the course of worship service, suddenly the, uh, uh, the public address system will interrupt all the service and, and you'll have a pause. We interrupt this service for a divine announcement. The Holy Spirit says, you know, how does the Holy Spirit talk? He talks through his people exercising a spiritual gift. So what happened in that mature eldership of the Antiochian church was one of the elders said, this is what the Holy Spirit is now saying. And it was confirmed. Now I mention that because the matter of receiving guidance through worship by means of a prophecy that someone else gives you is a very tricky and problematic area. And a lot of people have gotten into a lot of trouble on it. The Lord has revealed to me that you're to marry Susie. But God, I wanted to marry Jane. You know, no, it's Susie. The Lord has revealed to me that you're going to be a missionary in Zimbabwe. But Lord, I wanted to be a cashier in Fontana. <laughs> you know, how do, how do we deal with the Lord has told me that? It's an interesting little thing that goes on in regard to personal prophecy in the book of Acts. It starts at Acts chapter 9, I think it's around verse 20 or so, but in that area, Paul is wrapping up his experience at Ephesus, end of third missionary journey. And he says that he is determined in the spirit to go to Rome. That's, that's been a resolution in the spirit. Then when he meets with the uh, Ephesian elders at Miletus, Acts chapter 20, they warn him in the spirit that if he goes to Jerusalem, no, did I say, I'm sorry, back to Acts 19, he, he says in the spirit he's going to go to Jerusalem, not to Rome. The spirit has told me to go, but he, he, he advises me that there is much suffering ahead of me and bondage and imprisonment. When he gets uh, to uh, meet with the elders at Miletus, Acts chapter 20, they meet with him and through the Spirit they tell him the same thing. Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, you're, there's much imprisonment going to wait for you. When he comes to, uh, on his journey to what is Tyre, which is now in the news, you know, it's in Lebanon, it was biblical Phoenicia. There are the prophets, Acts, I believe, 21 verse 4, there are the prophets at the, in the church at Tyre, T-Y-R-E, meet him and they say, through the Spirit, do not go to Jerusalem. Notice that very carefully. They say, through the Spirit, do not go to Jerusalem. Then, moving a little bit further on, there is the prophet Agabus, who in Acts 12 had been right about the famine. Now he comes to Paul and he binds him with his own girdle, the, the sash he wore around his Middle Eastern robe. He wraps this around Paul and ties him up, symbolic prophetic act, which is common among the prophets. And he says, thus will be the man that goes to Jerusalem. He's going to be in fetters for having gone. The 
addition of all those factors has led some people to conclude that Paul got out of will, Paul got out of God's will when he went to Jerusalem. He should have never been going there. And as a result of getting out of God's will, he suffered his imprisonment. If he'd have listened to God and listened to the prophetic voice, he'd have never made that mistake. But such does not read carefully the scripture. Paul's word from the Lord is, go, but you're going to be bound. The church leaders at Ephesus who met him at Miletus said, go, but you're going to be bound. Agabus said, you're going to be bound. Only at Tyre and only the prophets there said through the Spirit, don't go. And I think what happened at Tyre is what I've seen happen in some charismatic circles. Someone keeps talking in the Spirit after the Spirit has quit talking. What the Spirit consistently had said in all the other appearances was, you're going to be bound. The Tyre prophets, however, having been given that revelation of the Spirit, try to add up two and two and force it as though the Spirit is now saying, therefore don't go. And one of the things we learn about personal prophecy from that is that the person whom the prophecy is given has a right scripturally and spiritually to analyze it, to agree with it or disagree with it. And Paul clearly disregards it because the Lord has given him a different witness. So there are well-meaning people who may not be sufficiently trained in spiritual giftedness to know when the Spirit has quit speaking, but they continue to say, thus saith the Lord. God will never turn the governance of your life over to somebody else. You are in the cockpit with the Holy Spirit, and it's up to you to have the final veto authority. No one else, not even your parents, ultimately. You're responsible before God for the decisions you make in life. What a prophetic word can do is generally, and I would say always, it is not a directional word. It is either a preparatory word or a confirming word. A preparatory word, that is, get ready, God's about to do this, or a confirming word, like as Acts 13, the, already the Lord had called Paul and Barnabas to the work which you have been called. Already they've been called, but now comes the confirming word. Now's the time to go. But it was not fresh revelation. It's either preparational or confirmational. But by all means, in looking at God's will, don't neglect this aspect. When you, when you come to where the saints meet, or when you meet with your prayer and Bible study group, what is God consistently impressing upon your heart? What's hot inside? I have this view of prayer that it's sort of like growing up in the rural days, some of us can go back and remember party lines and the neighbors listening in. Oh, for the good old days when you could find out what's going on in a community. <clears throat> Our prayer line, however, is not a party line. I believe we have privileged access with God. And listen carefully. Listen very sensitively to what God is saying to you when you're praying or when you're in worship, whether it's personal worship or corporate worship, because that generally, almost always, is a hot inspiration from the Holy Spirit. I've, and I try to encourage people, for example, when an altar call is given, a response is asked for, and you feel something tugging on your heart, that's just not you. The devil isn't going to tug in your heart to make some commitment to Jesus. That's got to be the Holy Spirit. So go with it. Respond to it. Look at what's happening in worship. A third way of getting guidance is circumstance. Circumstance. Your total life situation. Where are you as a person, geographically, positionally, age-wise? Look at some examples of this uh, matter of circumstance and how God used circumstance to guide people into his will. Acts chapter 6 is a circumstance. The circumstance was that there were widows in the early church that were having a problem with one another, having a good, honest contention with one another. Had it not been for that circumstance, there would have been no need for deacons. Had there been no need for deacons, there would have never been a Stephen. Had there never been a Stephen, there would have never been a martyrdom. And perhaps there would have never been a Paul. We went through this a few weeks ago. But it was a circumstance of a church contention that eventuated in Stephen stepping into the arena of God's will for his life directionally. Don't minimize these circumstances. The school you go to, for example, chances are if you're going to a Christian college, you've got about three chances out of four, you're going to meet your lifetime spouse there, you know. That's uh, what we call circumstantial guidance. Generally, we don't claim direct revelation for those things. Uh, the fact that I wear glasses has been a means of God's circumstantial guidance in my life. Powerfully, I don't know. I, I can't bring myself to 
to buy contacts. For, for one thing, I don't think I could get used to the new image I'm projecting. I'd probably be uncomfortable. And secondly, my, uh, my family tells me I, I need these to look more dignified. So <laughs> I, I still keep them. But I can remember my pioneer minister parents who told me after I'd broke about three pairs of glasses in a short period of time when I was around, uh, I guess, nine or ten years of age. George, we do not have money to keep getting you glasses. In those days, glasses cost the astronomical sum of eleven and a half dollars. And uh, we want you, Dad said to me, George, you've got to quit playing uh, basketball and contact football and those kinds of things or get yourself removed so you're not in the center of the action because that's where you're breaking your glasses, going for the ball or whatever. So I had to develop perimeter shooting and all those kinds of things. Stay away from bodily contact. And uh, ultimately, I think these glasses uh, got me in effect out of sports. Not that I was ever very physically coordinated, but I always had a deep interest in sports. But got me into books. It's because, these, I don't know, somehow, the, somehow for me, glasses went with being a bookworm. And so as a kid, I ate books. I mean, I had to read a book a day or it really wasn't a fulfilling day. And it was just, that's just the way God used my life. It developed in me a love for learning. And I don't think that would have ever happened without these things. So this was God's circumstantial way even of guiding me to the kind of lifetime so far that I've had, an interest in ideas, literature, and the like. God can use little circumstantial things in our life. Obviously, our parents and our heritage have a great role to play in what we become and what we do. That's part of, again, of our circumstantial guidance in life. So we look around at the circumstances in our life. Where, where do we find ourselves in respect to those circumstances? And uh, we'll often find, probably, that our circumstances don't so much directly guide us as they put us in places where we make the direct decisions. They, they put us in a convenient matrix where decision-making is possible. Uh, one of the neatest places, by the way, of circumstances that I find in all Scripture is this uh, how God guided this person, Luke. And we'll find this later at the uh, close of the... Uh, well, actually, it's at the beginning of the second missionary journey. Uh, Luke joins Paul in the city of uh, Troas and then crosses the Aegean Sea to Philippi, and then he drops out of sight. And he's out of sight while Paul finishes the second missionary journey and does the whole third missionary journey. So for about five years, he's not with Paul. But by the time Paul finishes the third missionary journey, he's at Corinth, and he has gathered a deputation of everybody from the churches which he has founded to take an offering to the Jerusalem saints. And at the last minute, Paul discovers that there's an assassination plot on his life, that they're going to get him when he gets on the boat in Corinth. So he sends everybody else on ahead, and he goes up by himself back up to northern Greece to Philippi, where he, of all things at Philippi, re-meets Luke. And suddenly, Luke is with him, not identified as Luke, but as we. He says we. That means he's back in the picture. And Luke then goes with Paul to Jerusalem. And Paul is arrested in Jerusalem, and Luke for two years is traipsing the countryside, and what's he doing during that period of time? He's doing what he says in Luke 1 through 4. He's interviewing the eyewitnesses of the life of Jesus. And record, he's a non-Palestinian Greek. So how would he know about the earthly ministry of Jesus? How would he know enough to write the history of, the, of Jesus in the third gospel in the book of Acts? He would have never had that opportunity to do the research needed to write the gospel in Acts had it not been for the fact that he got there. How did he get there? Because there was an assassination plot on Paul's life at Corinth which motivated Paul to go out to Philippi and get Luke to go with him. And had Paul not had that assassination plot, Luke would have stayed forever at Philippi and we'd have never heard from him again. But God used that circumstance to get him into a position where, in actuality, Luke writes more the New Testament than any other writer, more, more so even than Paul. Although Paul writes more letters and books, Luke writes more words. It's a powerful way God guided through circumstance. Don't underrate circumstances in your life. The fourth way we get guidance is through the confirmation of other believers. Through the confirmation of other believers. You see, we're not lone rangers in the body of Christ. As we're with the body of Christ, an active member of the Christian community, other people begin to read our gifts and begin to encourage us in the development along those lines and affirm us. For example, if I feel it is God's will for my life to be a pastor and to be a pastor teacher, which I feel has been God's will for me, uh, that will will not be implemented if there isn't anybody that wants to be pastored by me or hear me teach. You know, I can only do that if the body of Christ in some way, at least two or three people, give assent to that. It's the same with any spiritual gift. 
how, for example, did Matthias, Acts 1, know God's will for his life? Not because he had a supernatural revelation, not necessarily because of circumstances, not because of uh, an experience in worship, but because the early church decided to draw straws to cast lots, and Matthias was chosen to replace Judas. How did, uh, how did Judas and Silas, Acts 15, become uh, ministers to the Gentile community? It's because the Jerusalem church appointed them to that role. How did the elders of the missionary churches Paul founded get into leadership position because they were appointed? How did Timothy find God's will for his life? Not in the same way as Paul. Paul found God's will for his life by a direct revelation. Timothy found God's will for his life because one day Paul came along and said, you have ministry gifts and calling that I want to see implemented for the kingdom of God. Come along and be part of the team. Uh, so we may find uh, God's will in that, in that fashion, confirmation of the body. We had a young minister some time ago before the presbytery, and he had uh, wanted to pursue a particular line of decision that uh, some people weren't exactly satisfied with and did not really feel it was God's will. And he based his decision on the fact that God sovereignly and individually and personally led me, and how can you argue if God's speaking to me, how can you argue with me? That's a tough nut in guidance, by the way. What is the role of direct guidance from God versus the authority of the church. Jimmy Swagger's having this problem, isn't he? And we wrestle with it. It's, it's got to be held in, in kind of a balance. And I recall saying to this young man, I think this question can be, ought to be looked at not just from the standpoint that you feel God is guiding you to do this against the advice of all the presbytery and your neighboring pastors. You, you ought to look at a consistent interpretation of the question, and that is this. If you have someone in the church you pastor, let's say the Sunday school teacher, that you feel doesn't have the gifts of being a Sunday school teacher and you want them to do something else and you go to them and say, it's time for you to do something else because I, I don't sense that this is, this is working. And they say to you, you can't remove me because I've talked to God and God says I'm to do this. He said, I think you're going to be, at that point, you're going to override what they say because it's obvious by the fruitfulness of their ministry that a change has to be made. So I said, somehow... We've got to keep in balance this matter of individual revelation versus the consensus of the community of which we are part. If we've pledged ourselves to be within community, then we need to listen to community and what God is saying to us through our brothers and sisters. Listen very carefully to what people are saying to you about the areas in your life where you seem to have a real giftedness and propensity to succeed. We receive direction by listening to the body. So those are four steps. You say, I've tried all four and still haven't got guidance. Well, let me go to the fifth one. What do you want to do? What's in your heart? What's your decision? You say, is it biblical that I could make a decision without some sign from God, without some spiritual revelation, without some leading, leading in worship? What? Well, yes, it is. Look at the beginning of the second missionary journey, Acts chapter 15. Paul said to Barnabas, let us go visit the churches which we founded on the first missionary journey. That's my own translation. But he basically says, he looks at the need for follow-up, knows that these churches are suffering, and he says, we've got to go back and help them. We've got to get back. Notice how different this is from Acts 13, the beginning of the first missionary journey. Beginning of the first missionary journey, the Holy Spirit says, set apart. Barnabas and Saul. Beginning the second missionary journey, no mention of the Holy Spirit said. It's just Paul saying it makes sound human judgment to go back and do follow-up. Let's go back. And so they do. Uh, one of the things uh, that I've learned as a parent is that you, you want to you want to eventually get your children to make their own decisions. Oh, what a great day it was when our kids could tie their own shoes and dress themselves. <clears throat> now I wouldn't mind you know, put them in retrograde and getting them back that small, but I can't do that. But it was a wonderful day. I remember that. They go to the potty by themselves and those things. And parents generally like their children to grow up and make their own decisions. And, and I, I, I get a little nervous with people who get too spiritual on me. And they go to the grocery store and they're saying, well, the Lord told me to get pork and beans and, you know, then he told me to get napkins. And I say, well, okay, but generally... The Lord is pleased if we use some just some good common sense. I mean, he's not against. He's not against good common sense at all. 
And part of the dominion mandate uh, to have rule and authority, part of that is to make decisions. The Lord says, I will give you the desires of your heart. Well, if that's the case, it must mean we have some desires. And God is at work to fulfill those in our life. So we add that up and we say, well, Lord, oh, when all things are being considered and, and if, all, if all other means of guidance haven't indicated a clear direction, what's in my heart? What, what stimulates me the most? And we ought to, in regard to making that decision, we need to always ask, what do, we need to keep in balance, what do I want to do and what ought I to do? Sometimes our want and our ought don't line up. Several years ago, I wanted to make a particular decision, but it was the decision which the Holy Spirit let me very clearly know I was not to make because I ought not to do it. So even though I wanted to, I couldn't because I ought not. But if it is okay in the ought, O-U-G-H-T, and we want to, and there's no other blockage, then we might go ahead. I, I remember asking Morris Williams, who for years was uh, our field director in the Assemblies of God for the continent of Africa, and I said to him, in fact, he spoke at this church, is when I asked him this, this is about 10 years ago, I, and I've always respected and greatly admired uh, Morris Williams. I said to him, Brother Williams, you've been a missionary in Africa for over 25 years. How did you know it was God's will for you to be a missionary? It's my exposure to most missionaries, the most missionary calls as they're formulated in an atmosphere of travailing prayer and a sense of intuitive guidance. The Holy Spirit kind of puts lights of fire in their heart. So I was expecting this kind of an, well, I was at a youth camp or something like this when Morris Winsor responded to me. Instead, here's what he said. He said, well, George, you, it's not too spiritual what I'm going to tell you. But he said, um, when I was a young man, I, I really wanted to do something for God. And he said, I studied the scripture. I didn't get any clear sense of call. But he said, um, I decided that the Lord was looking for volunteers. So I volunteered. And maybe that doesn't strike you as an awfully spiritual way of getting called, but the, the standing orders of the gospel go into all the world, and the Lord's looking for laborers in the harvest of themselves may constitute a call if you want to volunteer for it. And there are many matters in life that the Lord simply says to us, what do you choose? It doesn't, maybe the Lord's saying, it really doesn't matter to me. So what do you want to do? What I generally look for when I'm trying to ascertain God's will is I start with, a, I start with supernatural revelation. I go to worship. I go to circumstances. I go to uh, confirmation of the body. And if I still don't have a sense of direction, then it falls back on my shoulder and it, it then gets logical. All the lists of why I should do this, all the lists of why I should do that. Wrestling back and forth until in the gut, I don't know how else to describe this, but in the gut there begins to be a sense of aliveness in, in the inside, more toward one side than the other. And uh, then I do something, I, I never found a scripture for this, but I think it's valid. A saying, Lord, I've sought you for guidance in this matter and you haven't answered by fire or by voice or by revelation or any other way, but I don't want to get out of your will. So Lord, three days from now or four days from now, whatever, I'm going to make this decision. In the meantime, I'm going to pray or fast or both, pray and fast. And if you don't want me to make this decision, then in the next few days, block me. Throw something in my path. Clearly block me. And if you don't block me, then I'm going to go ahead and do this. At 6 o'clock Wednesday night, I'm going to implement this decision. You have until, until 6 o'clock Wednesday night, Lord, to block this. And I mean this, Lord, in all sincerity. I actually did that, by the way. That was the final test in coming here. I, I said to the Lord, Lord, I'm going to fast for four days, and you have until Wednesday night, 6 o'clock. And if you don't block me in the course of time, then don't ever throw it up to me that I got out of your will. <laughs> you know, I gave you a chance. And I think God is fair. And he would do that. Now, one tricky thing, and I need to close with this, put you on warning so you'll know what's happening. Quite often, after you make a decision, there will come a period of doubt and second guessing. And you'll wonder, what in the world happened? Did I get out of my own? Did I, did I not hear God? What happened? I can share an incident again with you from Scripture, and it is from the second missionary journey. 
Paul said, let's go back and visit the churches. We found it on the first missionary journey. And so they do that. They, they travel over a land route you couldn't even go today if you were a non-Syrian. They start out in Syria, go north, and then come around into what is present-day Turkey, into the Taurus range, mountain range, into the area, biblical area of Antioch and, and uh, or Pisidian Antioch and Galatia and Phrygia and those kinds of wonderful provincial Roman names. And then when they're done revisiting those churches, Paul senses in his spirit that he wants to go west. So he strikes out. He is in what is lower central Turkey. And for the next how many days, we don't know, but it's about 400 land miles, he walks. He starts out. And he's got John Mark with him. He's got Silas with him. No, John Mark dropped out. He's got, he's got Silas and, um, and uh, he picked up Timothy. So he's got two full-time workers. They have left Antioch of Pisidia, which is the jumping off place, and they're heading in a northwesterly direction. And the Holy Spirit says to him, don't go to Asia. Well, Asia meant Ephesus, the headquarters of the Roman province of Asia. So Paul turns sharp north to go up to the underbelly of Russia, northern Turkey, to Bithynia. And again, the Holy Spirit says, no, don't go to Bithynia. Isn't it nice that God tells us no and doesn't tell us where? You know, this is one of the funny things about knowing God. Well, often we sense that we're not to do this, but we have the foggiest idea what we're supposed to do. And the key thing in those times is don't, don't, don't stand still. Don't get passive. Do not get passive in knowing the will of God. I know people that unfortunately get passive, lock themselves in a room somewhere and stay for days and days and come out more confused than when they went in. <laughs> Paul just kept putting one foot after another and he says, I know I'm not supposed to go to Ephesus and I know I'm not supposed to go to Bithynia, so evidently I can go in between. And that's what he does. He goes in between. If you look at it on a map, he goes, he heads right equidistant from Ephesus on this side and Bithynia on this side. I would love to have been a party to some of those conversations. Timothy especially, young man on his first missionary journey, one to the Lord probably by the Apostle Paul when Paul had been pelted with rocks in Timothy's hometown, the town of Lystra, which may have had much, as much an influence on Timothy's coming to faith, faith as all the miracles Paul did. He saw how Paul suffered, but that's a separate point. Um, <clears throat> About a hundred, you know, after walking, how long does it take to walk a hundred miles? Thirty miles a day, twenty-five miles a day? Well, they're hiking mountains and rivers, maybe twenty miles a day. Five days, let's say, they walked. <clears throat> Timothy finally gets up courage. Says, Brother Paul, it's so great to be on a missionary journey with you. I just have one question. Where are we going? <laughs> Paul gives a very spiritual answer. I don't have the foggiest idea. <laughs> it's great. I love to see apostles that don't know what they're doing. You know, it gives all the rest of us hope. He doesn't know what he's doing. He walks for 400 miles, which gives rise to my favorite poem, you know, plot on, plot on, plot on, plot on, plot on, plot on. Those are the only words. It can go in an infinite amount of verses. He just keeps walking. Someone has said that will of God is like riding a bicycle. You cannot guide a bicycle if you're standing still. You've got to get on it and get it moving. So I, I buy this theory of, of God's will. If you just keep knocking on doors, bang, bang. You, just, you know, I don't go passive. I don't, I don't see any precedent in Scripture for getting passive about God's will. Just keep pressing, keep active, keep searching. Something's going to happen. And the Lord knows when... See, this. if the Lord does guide our life, then that he's directing us even when we think we're being misdirected. And he'll use, he'll use the funniest ways to guide us. I, you know, being on this campus for me, so every once in a while I get a sense of deja vu, and I remember the first time I was ever on the SEC campus. I was uh, 20 years of age. I had just graduated from Evangel College. I'd come out to the West Coast to go to seminary, and, and I was choosing between three seminaries to go to. Seminary on the East Coast, a seminary in the Midwest, a seminary on the West Coast. The reason why I chose to come to the seminary on the West Coast was not because of any independent factor, like it was a better school and all those kinds of things. It's because there was a girl on the West Coast that I really was interested in. And it, and it was very frustrating as trying to establish a long-distance connection. It was not working. She happened to be a student at SCC. I, she did not know I was coming because we'd lost contact, but she was in my dim recesses of my mind, you know, a very bright spot. 
And uh, so I, I decided I need to come out here. And I arrived at Fuller Seminary on a Friday afternoon, and the dorms were not yet open, and I was in my little two-tone green 54 Pontiac pulling a trailer with books. That's, you know, what does a single guy have but books and a trailer? And I thought, well, there's no place to stay here, and I don't have a lot of money. I'll go down. I think school's out at SCC, but I'll go down there anyway. It was the days before there were freeways here. You got off at Harbor Boulevard and came down some way through the, through the bean fields. And I arrived at the dorm, found indeed there was a place I could stay in the dorm for a few days, and went to use a telephone, pay phone out by the quad to make a phone call. And out of the blue walks this girl. It was such a confirming sign of God's will. <laughs> You know, I said, wow, here, everybody's gone, and she stayed. Thank you, God. Everything's going to work out all right. <laughs> Two years later, she married somebody else, you know. <laughs> but God never wanted me, you see, to marry her. He just wanted to get me to the West Coast. So don't be surprised if you, if you have things like that happen to you in life. You think you're, you're, that's the goal, that's what God has for me, and you get to it, and all of a sudden it's not there, and you're so mad. I was so mad at God. I didn't want to talk to God. It's a dirty deal, God. And I, I didn't understand it at the time, what was going on. The God was simply saying, uh, he was laughing up there. He's saying, ha, 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 I got you to California. <laughs> you know, I didn't see that. Because, you see, what often happens is we confuse ends and means. Something that is an end to us is only a means to God. That's never where he intended us to go anyway. So he just uses it to get us there, and then he discards it. <laughs> so that's what's going on with Paul. Paul's walking, you know, 400 miles, ta -ta -ta, getting sore feet. I, ain't, it, I haven't walked 400 miles anywhere in my life, but boy, that's, that's a hefty piece to hike. Finally, Paul gets to the place where he can't walk anymore. He's at the sea. He's at Troas. He's at the Aegean. Where does he go? Nowhere to go except back up. He's not about to back up. And just at the point where he runs out of his ability to keep going, that's the key. He kept going until he ran out of the ability. Then the Lord said, uh, in a vision, real mysterious, come over to Macedonia and help us. And that's all the thin, slender thread he has to hang his hat on, a vision. And not a very strong means of guidance, but he gets on the boat and goes over. There's no man of Macedonia there. There's, there's no man at all. You look, his first convert in Philippi was a woman, Lydia, and that's who he's worshiping with down by the riverside. And if he was the misogynist woman hater that some people think he was, he would have said when he found that group of women down by the riverside, man, nothing but women here, can't preach to them. You know, no, where's the man from Macedonia? God called me to meet a man. But it's a woman, Lydia, who becomes the first convert in Europe. And suddenly the whole city opens to the gospel. And he finds his man in the Roman jailer. But wow, the key point I'm trying to get across is that he didn't give up. He kept on walking in spite of disappointment, in spite of wrong turns in the road, in spite of what even looked like cul-de-sacs. He didn't give up. He kept going. And if you'll not lie down on God, if you'll get up and keep going, Ultimately, in your lifetime, God will establish his will, and you will see that the steps of a righteous person are water to the Lord. You'll see it. You may not see it at the time. You may be very frustrated. But don't give up. Keep walking. Now, sometimes, in knowing the will of God, he may use more than one of these. He may use personal worship, confirmation of the believers, something you feel in your heart to do. I'm not suggesting that you're only guided by one but I've tried to give you a pattern and a logical way of working through decision-making, starting with supernatural revelation, all the way where all the emphasis is upon God to personal decision-making where all the emphasis seems to be on you. And then there's the great middle ground in between. And we've gradually winnowed that down and said, here are the factors, here are the only factors that we see in Scripture for the, for the uh, rationale for making a decision in God's will. So use these factors and God will guide you and the Holy Spirit will lead you. Amen? Amen. That's all I have to say. Let's stand.